Um, at this point in time, we're going to have our final session where Dr. Gardner is going to be coming and sharing some more pointers with us. Um, so I'm going to ask Elena if she could give us the outline for how this final session will be. You just want me to start? All right, so I think we are ready to start our next session. We would like to welcome Dr. Gardner, um, and I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic um, to him. Thank you so much. I'm always interested in a day long, or less than a day, professional development, let's event like this, what our retention rate is. How are we holding the students? So Alana, do you, can you give us a measure of how many people are still online? We do have 80 plus people online. So wow. thank you all for staying wow. with us. <laughs> wow, that is the Lehman spirit. What a great compliment. And I think that's especially a compliment to all those who have preceded me. This has been a marvelous day. I am leaving so high, a legal high. And uh, there was not one keynoter here. There were as many keynoters as there were presenters. What a pantheon of, of thoughtful gods you have assembled today. This has been really exciting. And I hope you're leaving today with greater appreciation for the wealth that is on your, your faculty and staff. I, I wanted to model something that um, I'd like to get some feedback from you on in the chat shortly. And that is about what you've been learning and how you've been reacting. But I wanted to share with you some of the things that I got out of the uh, sessions by your colleagues and what for me are the takeaways to stimulate you to think about your takeaways, which are more important than my takeaways. You may recall that right after lunch in the session on the use of primary texts, we were invited to think about the things that we have read or we have used in our teaching as primary texts that may have had a profound influence on us or that we hope will in our students. And I did a quick recall of my own college experience and I came up with four texts that I read. And after I wrote them down, I enumerated, they're all written by white men, surprise. But the first was, uh, actually the first were two books that I read in my first year. I mentioned one of them, Escape from Freedom by Eric Fromm. But the other was by a prominent 20th century sociologist David Reisman at Harvard, uh, and he wrote a book called The Lonely Crowd. And this was a book that my professor gave me because the book talked about two kinds of citizens that the United States produces, what he called an inner directed person and an outer directed person. And he was hoping that I would be an inner directed person, uh, the inner directed person who makes decisions based on his or her values, the inner thoughts and creativity. The outer directed person is more one who looks outside him or herself for cues and clues from other people as to what's the socially acceptable behavior. And of course, uh, Reisman didn't tell me until many years later that uh, college professors overwhelmingly are interdirected people, which is also why on other measures, about 75% uh, of us are introverts and only 25 are extroverts. But anyway, uh, it was uh, almost 25 years after I read that book that Reisman reached out to me from Harvard and initiated me in about a 10 year long uh, correspondence about an article that I had written in something that he was very interested in. Reisman was the founder of the Harvard Freshman Seminar, and I was the founder of my institution's first year seminar. Anyway, the third was Plato's Republic. I mentioned the philosopher who spoke with us before, that the most important work I read in undergraduate school was Plato's Republic, in which a white male, a Greek philosopher, Socrates, um, raises the question uh, through Plato of uh, what is justice? And I didn't know when I graduated from college how I was going to pursue this, but I knew that the central guiding question for me, if I were lucky, was to pursue justice for others as well as myself. And finally, in college, the writings of the 19th century American transcendentalist, Ralph Waldo Emerson, particularly his essay on self-reliance. Now, as I listened to your colleagues this morning and the course redesign, I couldn't help but wonder why you had a 50% attrition rate. This was an optional a voluntary experience for your faculty. I was impressed that 30 of them obviously uh, completed and had significant impact. But I think it's important to know if you wanna design something in the future, what can you do to retain your volunteers who undertake this kind of work? It would be interesting if you could do a kind of no fault survey and find out what led to their decision to connect or not connect, or continue or not continue this. 
as I listened to the reimagined, re, yeah, the, the reimagining, the redesigning course uh, design, and then the women who talked about the Atlas uh, project on primary text, I wonder how those two initiatives could or should be integrated in some ways. They're both around faculty development, they're both around engaging students more effectively in learning. Uh, what, could be, what could be learned uh, from each other? Um, in the um, session we had just before lunch, the last speaker, as she walked off, the, almost walked off the platform, reminded all of us that we're like students too, in that we are having struggles in the pandemic era. And there was a need for a kind of faculty support group and attention to the struggles that faculty are having. And of course, that's just one more, one more charge for our, our provost and his um, associate provost. You know, it'd be my hope that as you continue the course redesign process, you take an, uh, an even more ambitious uh, approach to this. And you, you look at how a course redesign is linked to what I call the ecosystem surrounding uh, gateway courses. The ecosystem consists of all your policies, how you do placement, how you orient students, how you advise students, how you select the faculty to teach these courses, how you evaluate the faculty, how you reward and motivate the faculty, your tenure promotion criteria. Gateway course instruction depends on the facilities. You just heard that 170 classrooms here are being designed for high flex um, modality. That's extraordinary to move that far this fast. But that, so the facilities have a huge impact on instruction the level of technological support, and of course, the extent of academic support. What faculty do in gateway courses is not just a function of what they do. It's a function of how the whole college works. You know, as Hillary Clinton said in her book, it takes a whole village to raise a successful gateway course uh, student. Uh, I, I gave the, um, the Atlas group uh, some feedback, but it, it made me wonder how does the college or could the college encourage you faculty and staff to participate in some of your faculty colleagues' courses? Can you audit courses? Are there abbreviated versions of their courses? I wanted to take all four course, courses that I heard about after lunch today. How could I do that if I was a, a faculty member here? Uh, I remember at my own university, my provost designed a series of what were called teaching learning or Ann Brown bag lunches where once a month, we gathered to hear a faculty member talk about his or her work. And the attendance was so strong at these, they had to offer trailer sections. And what we realized was you don't need, is nearly, you don't really need any outside speakers or experts. You got them right here. You know, you should be listening to yourselves because you're an extraordinarily powerful uh, community. So that session really uh, engaged me um, intellectually. And I couldn't help but wonder, could that um, project, can it be expanded to think about what are the ways you use texts and other types of pedagogies and assignments into the core courses for in effect your transfer students, the courses they take as they enter their majors in the upper divisions at Lehman. Uh, there's, there's a lot of potential uh, of that effort. A few other ideas as I was listening to the, the sessions uh, today, I was wondering if you might want to organize, um, sometimes these are called book, book clubs or faculty staff reading groups where you select things that you jointly will read and talk about and feedback to the leadership here, what are the implications for how you go about uh, learning and supporting students at, uh, at Lehman College. I would invite you to go back and look at the, um, the chapter that my wife and I wrote about you um, 20, 20, 19 years ago, actually, to see uh, what has endured about the first year and, and, and what has changed. Um, the comment that two of the speakers made in the um, um, CUNY advising train, I, I gave a lot of feedback on that at the end. I am so excited about that. I'm already thinking of ways that I can help you sell that. Uh, but one of the things that I really walked away from that with was this, this search for wacky ideas, okay? And could you, should you have a process at Lehman College for the search for wacky ideas? And as I was talking about that with your provost and your president, your president shared with the provost and I that at a former institution, there was a quote, dean for new ideas. Do you need a dean for new ideas at Lehman? 
uh, one of the uh, other case studies that my wife and I wrote about in the book that Lehman has portrayed was a study um, based on Appalachian State University, which is in Boone, North Carolina. And there back in the 70s, they established a so-called Dean for Innovation. And the faculty Senate actually made a formal motion when they did that to appoint a Dean for the status quo. So you, need, you, you never know how we're gonna respond to, to some of these things. The, the high flex session taught me that, uh, reminded me that folks, we all lived through this. March of 2020, we should have dispelled any doubters who would say that higher education cannot adapt and cannot change. And that we're still doing what we did a thousand years ago before the invention by Gutenberg of movable type. What you did in three or four days was you transformed American higher education. You didn't have time to consult the faculty Senate, get a faculty vote of approval. You simply said, we're all going home in four days, goodbye. And look what the results of it are. This high flex uh, approach is extraordinary. It's the, it's the Burger King of Lehman College. It's have it your way. Uh, students can decide how they wanna learn. You know, I'm wondering how does that influence advising? How can advising make good suggestions on how students might most successfully take advantage of the high flex model? You know, for a thousand years, there was not a high flex way. There was only one way or the highway. And that one way was determined by the person, literally the stage, the sage on the stage. Now there's no longer any one way. And that, um, that is really exciting. And you're hearing how the college is moving to institutionalize this in a, with extraordinary uh, rapidity. So I hope you're, you've been deciding uh, what you have been getting out of what your colleagues said today. I wanna remind you of who your students are. And I wanna cite some characteristics of your students that I don't think begin to do them justice. Almost 70% of them are transfers. 15% are first time fresh, for freshmen. 50% come from family unit incomes of less than 30,000. 90% are of color. 45% speak another language at English other than home. 35% are from the outside of the United States, 70% are female, 57% are first generation, and the immediate age of your undergraduate students is 25. Ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly the population that unfortunately many educators in our country still have very limited expectations of. You do not have limited expectations of that population which it makes me so excited and is why in a few minutes, I wanna offer you some suggestions about where you could go with Lehman Colleges receiving the place in the sun, S-U-N, that I, I think it deserves. I wanna go back here and just share a couple of things from my, um, oh, where is um, my life support system here? This slide, is, oh, here, I gotta use this, that's right. Well, yes, okay. I'd like you to start entering in the chat um, what you believe the college is doing well. You know, I wanna go back to the original subject, which was transfer. We've spent proportionately maybe half the day, the CUNY advising train, the, um, um, the, the Atlas project, uh, these, of course, the high flex uh, uh, imp impacted transfers, the my session, so the day has been at least 50% on transfer. Kind of in the bookend, we began with that. I wanna conclude with that, the symmetry there. So I'd like you to offer some reflections on what you think the college is doing well. Enter that in the chat. And at the same time, um, juxtapose that with what you believe, do the, what is it doing well first, and then go on and doing what you think it is not doing well, okay? Again, you're protected, this is anonymous. We can't trace this to you. And uh, I, while you're doing that, I wanna um, offer just a few um, other comments here. Um, I've got to advance my slides to get where I need, okay, yeah. Um, I, I would suggest that you think even more intensively about how you communicate what I call communities of practice around your functional areas and that you join those Lehman functional areas with those at Hostos and Bronx Community College. You're already doing that to some degree, but I think the synergy could be very powerful. I think you need to institutionalize processes 
for asking uh, transfer students here how they are experiencing this institution. What can you learn for that? In other words, creating context where you listen to transfer students. Some institutions have appointed a so-called transfer czar. Do you need that? I don't know. I, I think you've got already, uh, one of the unique things about this here is you have a provost, if I may speak about him as if he's not in the room, and I know he is in the room. Uh, in many institutions, the provost and that office are in effect outsourcing the transfer experience to other units. They're outsourcing it, especially to enrollment management. Now, enrollment management here, as I've been made very aware, has had a very dynamic role to play in increasing ways to, to ease the transition of transfer students and get their transcripts evaluated more rapidly and to um, give them feedback on the application of those credits and make any, a number of other improvements. But it, it is relatively uncommon for the chief academic officer to focus as much on the academic experience of transfer students as I see, as I see here. So there may already be a, trans, a transfer in effect czar, but it, it's a worthwhile question. Um, in general, I, I think what we have to do is we have to realize this is an urgent issue. Transfer students are suffering. And, you know, I, I, I suggested to one institution, which is actually moving to consider this, what would happen if you established an 800 number for transfer emergencies? You'd have to staff it but uh, it would be a very dramatic way of saying, we really want to know uh, what you're experiencing. Before I uh, go any further here, um, Elena, what have we got on what people uh, want to see that the college is, what they believe the college is doing well, and what they believe the college is not doing well in? Sure. So a few things that came up is we have great transfer agreements and alignment. Um, we don't do enough to help them through transfer shock or to find ways that they don't experience that shock. Um, thinking outside of the box on how best to support students' real needs, such as food and security, need for technology to support learning, advising, etc. Another comment on doing well is dynamic student service delivery model that has constantly changed and evolved over the past few years to increase capacity uh, to, see, uh, to see students based on available resources. Another comment regarding doing well, no need for transfer uh, tsar. We need to support and listen to the folks who do the work. Okay, all right, by the way, I would suggest um, that this, what's been put in the chat in the sessions today be provided to the task force that has created this event today and consider what are the actionable things that come out of these chat comments. Do a synthesis of these comments. Are there common themes, common concerns? And that'll give you a clear idea of where to, uh, to move next. Um, one of the uh, suggestions that I wanted to ask you to think about is about the category where we tend to find the greatest degrees of frustration um, and at times injustice for students. And that's the areas that, of transfer that are still determined by individual, what I call discretionary review, that are not determined by explicit, predictable, transparent policies. Discretionary review uh, leads to inconsistency of determinations about transfer, lack of transparency, the potential for bias, prejudice, capriciousness, a general lack of predictability, and sometimes the interest in boosting the awarding of credit hours in the receiving unit here at Lehman by depriving the students of credits. Uh, I, that's not a complimentary interpretation but I see this going on all over the country, particularly in departments where enrollments are declining. The, the deniability of credit also puts those who have discretionary review in the role, five minutes, okay, on this portion, yeah, not for the whole thing, um, in the position of doing what accreditors are supposed to do, which is the Middle States Association is officially responsible for reviewing your compliance with accreditation standards. And in effect, I think this, matter of discretionary review 
uh, bumps up against that and may even be usurping that function. And furthermore, when we arbitrarily deny students credit, we're denying them the opportunity to test out in the marketplace that they could really do the work for which you're telling them you don't think they can do. You know, if you, you could, they, they could test that out by taking the course. If they don't make it, they repeat it or they change their major or whatever. But in effect, it's a form of denying students the opportunity to prove themselves. I heard your, um, I, I assume he's one of your uh, IR staff uh, this morning make the comment that I had given a, a lot of assignments for additional homework on data collection. And I hope that, um, you know, it was not perceived as um, inappropriate because I, I think you're already collecting a lot of data, but there are even more of the right and best questions that you could be asking. Finally, I'd like to comment about from the big picture of American higher education, what's at stake here that could affect Lehman? What's at stake here if we don't improve transfer? You know, you've all heard the phrase, it's being used in the United States Senate right now, it's called the, the nuclear option. Mr. Schumer, is uh, the person who's talking about the nuclear option. He doesn't use that language, but his Republican opponents do. The nuclear option is taking away the power of the filibuster, okay? But in this case, in the transfer sphere of American higher education, the nuclear option is expanding the authority to two-year colleges in the United States to cease their being two-year colleges and to allow them to award baccalaureate degrees. Transfer degree completion is a function of demand um, and supply. There's tremendous demand from students entering the two-year sector. The supply right now is limited because it's limited only to the, in the case of your type of institution, 420 regional public comprehensive universities in the United States, of which you are a distinguished member. So what's happening in some states, most notably Florida, Michigan, and Texas, is that state legislatures are gradually expanding the prerogative of community colleges to offer bachelor's degrees. If you're concerned about that, we better get transfer right. Increasingly, another thing that's happening, it's happening here in New York State, is the, um, what's the name of that legislation that was passed two years ago? I'm forgetting anyway, it, it opens up more money for um, the awarding of your state financial aid package. Um, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, more and more of the private institutions are becoming more flexible about the receipt of transfer credits. This is a highly competitive market. You don't have quite a restraint of trade here uh, in the Bronx. There are private uh, institutions, um, but uh, you know, you're still the only public uh, senior level college in a borough, 1.4 million people. For-profit institutions are attempting to serve this market. And I think, I know as a matter of fact, you all should know, the six regional accrediting bodies are under pressure for the United States Department of Education to up their game in monitoring our quality. And if the accreditors don't do a better job of this, there are threats that the federal government will take the whole thing over. And you definitely do not want that, okay? And so one of the things I think is going to happen is that accreditors are going to be looking increasingly at what we are and are not doing to promote transfer. So that's another reason to uh, get our house in order. Okay, I'd like now to move into some concluding uh, questions for you. And then I wanna share with you some questions that I have that I'm trying to answer in a more concrete way. These are questions I developed once I started preparing for this visit to Lehman. And I don't know whether it was apparent or not, but I do try to uh, do my homework, by the way. I, I should have suggested this one. I, this was a, well, it's a question I have, and then I'll get to the rest of the afterwards. And I call this, are you ready? And are you ready refers to something that is beginning to happen, and I'm excited to be a part of it. I'm not taking credit for this, but I am a part of it. Uh, there, for the first time, a major American foundation has awarded a grant to two organizations, the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association and the nonprofit, which I lead. And this is a national project involving four states, Washington, Colorado, North Carolina, and South Carolina. And these four states are asking this question. And the question is, what would you have to do to have an excellent transfer system for a whole state that would include public institutions, private institutions, not-for-profit, for-profit, two-year and four-year? 
the whole approach to transfer in a given state system. Admittedly, it's what I call an aspirational question. It's a measurement question. How would you measure excellence? And uh, the idea is that if we don't take more steps to create an educationally excellent transfer system, legislatures are gonna do this. And the more and more federal legislation will guide this as well. Federal legislation already policy affects us because of the 120 hour credit limit on maintaining eligibility for financial aid. Students lose financial aid eligibility through the transfer credit hemorrhaging process. So um, what we're developing in this project is a set of standards of excellence for systems to achieve transfer excellence. So I, I'm hoping that other states will do this. All right, I'd like to ask you five questions and to ask you to share your thoughts about these questions in the chat, okay? And this is where you, this is a, a kind of, we, one of your speakers today talked about using the primary text as a form of formative assessment. This is a more of a summative assessment. So I'd like to ask you, what did you learn today about your college that you didn't know before? What did you hear about that you weren't aware of? I had read about some of what I heard, but I, I'm leaving here knowing an awful lot more about Lehman College than I knew. This has been a total immersion experience for me, and I've loved every minute of it. I am no longer objective about Lehman College. I lost my objectivity once I started reading about you. Okay, so what did you learn today about Lehman College that you didn't know before? Alana? So we're going to give everybody a few seconds to type in the chat um, their responses. And for those of you who are here in person, uh, we also ask you to contribute to the chat. Um, and if the time allows, um, we could also enable you to speak up as well. So in the chat, a few things that are coming up. Um, I did not know about the Atlas initiative taking place until I looked at the agenda for the summit. So thank you for including that in the summit. Um, transfer students are a big concern. I learned more about some of the amazing work our faculty um, have implemented in the classroom. I learned a lot more about the CUNY train. I had heard a little about it and I'm truly, uh, and it is a truly impressive work. It is a great attribute to enrollment management and all of its work. We're going to give it a few more seconds if okay. anyone else wants to add. By the way, these uh, comments could be excerpted or shared verbatim with the presenters today. Uh, for example, the folks from the CUNY advising train, they, they need to see that comment. Anything else on this one? Not for now. Okay, the second question then, uh, not only what did you learn, but more precisely, what did you hear today that inspired you or pleased you. You're, you're leaving this day today feeling better about being a member of the Lehman College faculty staff. What did you hear that inspired and or pleased you? Alina, as you start, as soon as you start seeing things, if you go ahead. Sure. And so we have a few folks uh, already commenting, and I invite the rest of the attendees to comment as well. So the first comment is, I was encouraged to learn that a focus on depths with a small number of texts proved equally valid to the assignment of many texts. Next one is about high flex. I learned more about the high flex option our students have to learn. The next comment is, I'm proud to be part of this community of individuals who are truly dedicated to our students. Okay. All right, let's go on to the third one. Looking to after this summit, the provost and all the other folks that put this together are gonna to be asking themselves, what should our top priority actions be going forward? What did we hear 
in this summit? What have people told us? So the question is, what do you think the college's top priority action items for this academic year should be for advancing student success writ large, especially transfer, I would argue, but just what do you wanna see the top priorities? Can't do everything, gotta make choices, gotta have a focus. If you were making these decisions, what would you choose? Many of the priorities are discretionary. COVID dumped all kinds of things in our laps that took discretion away from us. We had to do them. But you've got a feast of riches here. There are things you don't have to do. Elena. So I'd just like to um, answer the previous question. Yes. There are a few more comments came okay. in regarding um, what did you hear today that inspired and pleased concerned you? Yes. And that was, I was surprised and concerned to hear transfer students are not mentioned in the college's mission and vision statements. Um, Those statements, by the way, didn't come from Moses. Uh, they were created here. Another comment was um, uh, the comment to implement the CUNY train. Mm -hmm. um, the next comment is Lehman has amazing faculty, but they are very overworked. How can we increase full-time faculty? They are overworked, but what really stuck, struck me today was what a number of them were choosing voluntarily to do, even given their current workload. And some of them chose things that made them have to work even harder, mm -hmm. as they said in the flex model. And a few other comments pertaining to that same question, college's emphasis on transfer student success. And the next one is, I learned that students are choosing the in-person component slowly in some high flex classes. And I think uh, now the comments are coming in for question number three. Uh, what do you think the college's top priority action items should right. be? Um, so they are, Increase advisement for transfer students, increased focus on transfer students, have an integrative approach with two year colleges, to provide more support and advisement to transfer students to continue to be friendly. There's a question Is Lehman ready to make transfer a priority and invest? CUNY train was in response to this question, transfers need to be a priority. What, what was that last one? CUNY train was in response to this question, transfers need to be a priority. Okay. So that's yes, pertaining to the question in the chat, is Lehman ready to make transfer a priority and invest? Right. Okay. Okay. By the way, the provost is taking notes for those of you that can't see him, so. Okay. Any, any others to that question yet, Lena? We can come back to it. All right. Maybe we could just give a couple more seconds because I see that yeah, folks sure. are typing. Okay. So let's just give a couple more seconds. So the other comment that came in is identify transfer common courses, if there are any, and look at student success in those courses. So let's return to the question of what it would mean to be a more transfer friendly college. Think about what you heard today and enter into the chat what you think Lehman College could do to become an even more transfer friendly college. Anything you think it could do. It's not saying it isn't already transfer friendly. This is about upping the game there becoming more intentionally transfer friendly.
There's a comment in the chat noting, allow new students to provisionally declare a major so that they can enroll in classes immediately. Major advisement could then take place before second semester here. The other comment is, uh, do more to create community and make transfer students feel at home. This can also lead to more of them staying for graduate school. Absolutely. The yep. other comment is some of the more than one third of participants here who were transfer students could serve as mentors or in other roles to help integrate transfer students into the Lehman experience. 30%, 34% of today's participants were former transfer students. It's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. The next comment is partner more closely with institutions from where students come, community colleges to prepare students. Right. The next comment is link transfer students to mentors. Many transfer students stay linked to their community colleges because they have deep relationships there. Let me just point out that uh, research has confirmed that when you look at mentoring by gender, men are much more likely to be mentored than are women. And 70% mm -hmm. of your students are women. Okay. Mm -hmm. So great need there that may not be met. One more comment in the chat. Continue to develop more articulation agreements with feeder schools. Maximize the credits earned in other colleges. There's one more comment. Continue with our colleagues at the community colleges in BTAG for a seamless student transfer to Lehman. Other examples, ease in transfer shock, course transferability and pedagogical continuity. And the next comment is some of what we're doing now with fine tuning how transfer students learn about processes such as degree works, Lehman 360, and how every one of us approaches transfer student in a welcoming way. We serve them. And another comment is more peer mentoring for transfer students. Okay. All right, now um, that was in response to becoming a more transfer friendly college. I'd like to return to the, you know, a, a final observation here embedded in a question that fundamentally while your mission is to serve all students, you have a special commitment to serve the Bronx. Your students here that come from Bronx high schools come from the lowest performing high schools in the city of New York. What do you especially need to do to show the way for more student success for and in the Bronx? How could you connect the borough more intentionally to these student success initiatives. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm getting a high sign for my uh, my um, handler here. Okay. About time. Okay. You're gonna gonna read a few out there. So I added the question in the chat for everyone who is um, remote as well as in person. What can the college do to lead the way for greater student success? Bronx focused initiatives, diverse faculty body, et cetera. So we invite you to participate in the chat or we do have a few minutes that we could ask those who are in person here to also comment um, on audio. All right, I would like to share with you now, if I may, some questions that I have for you, or that, that are the ones actually that really for me as well. I'm thinking about these. I don't have the answers to them, but I'm gonna keep thinking about them. I'm more than ever asking, what does it mean to be a predominantly transfer focused institution? How do you operationalize that? What are the obligations that go along with that? What should we be calling American higher education institutions who have that unique institutional characteristic? There isn't a generally accepted name for institutions like you. You're unique, but there are some others that are attempting to do the same thing, okay? So what should we calling, be calling you other than brave, courageous, determined, passionate, 
can think of a lot of potential turns. Is it time that this country and its higher education system establish any kind of intentional, formal cohort or coalition of colleges and universities that have this mission? And if so, what could Lehman's role be in doing that? If you don't take that role, somebody else is going to. This is a crying need. There's no organization now that is producing a journal for this. There's no organization that's convening research around this. There is, um, there is not that I know of a national center that focuses on this. I follow national centers. I have founded two of them in my career. So this is kind of something I know. Why couldn't you do that here at Lehman? You have created, you don't use this term, but you have created a consortium. You call it BTAG. A consortium in higher education is a collection of post-secondary institutions and sometimes other partners that come together in a common geographic region. They create a partnership to achieve a specific mission or missions. There are a number of them now, not a huge number, but there are a few that come to have come together to focus on transfer. These are in places like Tulsa, Oklahoma, Austin, Texas, San Bernardino, California, um, Dayton, Ohio, um, Orlando, Florida. Uh, I can think of others, but you are one of them. There's also a national association that's called ACL, the Association for collaborative learning that brings together colleges and universities who are engaged in consortial work. Why should we be doing consortial work? Because it saves us money, it pools ideas, it pools resources, it builds us more friends and more allies. When we create a consortium, foundations are more likely to give it money. We get a slice of that money, okay? We have greater strength in numbers. Um, I'm thinking you, could profit from being more connected to other consortia focused on transfers and in general to the consortial movement. I've had another question and that, I don't know how many of you have had this experience. It has to do with what makes an American college or university an HSI. You are an HSI. 48% of your students are classify in some way as Hispanic, okay? the generally agreed cutoff for that is 25% of the population, okay? You're way beyond that. Now, I've been on a lot of institutions that classify themselves as an HSI, but you'd never know it if you didn't know that classification. You don't see any artwork that celebrates it. You don't see any evidence of that in the, in the food services, holidays, uh, celebrations, ceremonies. What's it mean to be an HSI? More importantly, I think, what does it mean to be a predominantly transfer institution? There are uh, similarities. Um, this is all related, of course, to being not only transfer friendly in terms of your credit articulation, but transfer um, affirming, okay? Transfer affirming, what, what does that mean? Th this is an institution where you have significantly less time to work with transfer students. You got something in the chat? Yes, we actually have quite a few responses okay, to that last question. To so so um, the question was, what can the college do to lead the way for greater student success? And some of the comments are K through 12 linkages to colleges, even more than what we already have. Outreach to high school counselors. Many students um, come and having heard that college is anonymous and nobody helps them. They were terrified of college. The other comment is continue to expand our relationships with CBOs that are already engaging with our students. Um, the other comment is New York City um, high school counselors have so many students assigned to them. We have so many excellent teachers produced by the School of Education who could be encouraged to talk more about their college graduate school experience. The other comment is about the um, notes, the urban male leadership program strives to reach out to the local high schools in the Lehman area. However, due to COVID-19, we have not been able to physically go out to the local high schools um, and community colleges based on recruitment. 
All right, yes, I, um, I need to pull this to a conclusion. I will, just a couple of other questions. One of the things that baccalaureate degree granting institutions are attempting to do now, all of them, not just the elites, is what do you do to produce not only successful, but highly contributory participating alumni? So how do you imbue students here with the Lehman spirit when they're here, many of them, not for the whole treatment? Some of them, they're not even here half of their undergraduate degree. Do you really need two different versions of a first year experience here? One for first year uh, freshmen, another for transfer students. How are they similar? How are they different? Um, what's the difference between gateway courses for first year students versus for transfer students? There's so many questions, but they all revolve around what is this uh, unique mission of yours and how much are you gonna own it? How much are you gonna recognize it? How much are you gonna say, this is really who we are and what we do. And we're gonna do this as well, if not better than anybody we know of in the United States. I began with a terse uh, saying and observation. It's stability is the handmaiden of innovation. If you're very lucky here, and I believe you will be, you will, you will have the requisite stability of these people who will stay engaged with each other and stay focused on this to develop this work till its full potential. Do not walk away from this. Do not keep looking for the Holy Grail somewhere else. You're, you've already discovered much of what you need to be doing. I am designing right now a 50 year celebration for the most, generally what's regarded as the most important innovation, the so-called first year experience movement and the first year seminar. It was started 50 years ago at my university. I was one of the founders of this. And what I've learned more than anything else is, uh, as President Kennedy once said, success has many parents and disaster is an orphan, okay? And what I'm seeing here at Lehman is there are all kinds of parents here for this work that we've seen today. Many parents, and that's what you need to sustain. And I am optimistic because you have the capacity to do it. I think you realize you must do it, you can do it. And I hope you think about some of the ways you can do it and own your, as one of your senior, um, what do you call it here, the CUNY Central. I remember when you used to call it 80th Street. I think you call it 42nd Street now, don't you? But one of the CUNY Central folks, that it's time for CUNY to own this, okay? I wanna see Lehman own this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm rarely invited, ever invited back for reasons which you've seen today. And it's really been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Let me turn this back over to the, um, the organizers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gardner, for walking us through this discussion. Alina would not want me to miss this opera. Oh, nuts. Well, I'm just gonna read it out. Would you enter in the, play, the chat, please? What we call an intention statement. This is a tradition in the American South. It's kind of um, a revival ceremony. You come up to the front of the congregation and you acknowledge that you've been saved, all right? So would you please enter a statement of something you intend to do, you will do to support this effort on making Lehman a more transfer friendly institution. We'd like to know any insight you have on what you can do. Back to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gardner, for leading us in this critical discussion on the transfer experience at Lehman College. And once again, um, could we give our keynote speaker a round of applause, please? This has been an incredible day, a day when we have heard from, our, from an awesome keynote speaker, a day when we heard from our colleagues um, who led us on in four panel discussions that talked about some of the work that we're doing here as we strive to move student success forward at Lehman College. We are indeed a leader in CUNY as it relates to education attainment and student success. As we bring this day to a close, I would like to um, welcome once more President Elgada to give closing remarks, followed by um, closing comments from our very own provost, uh, Peter Wasu. Thank you.
um, President Delgado's um, comments will be coming remotely from his office. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's been a long day for everybody. Um, and it's long because it's good. So many good ideas, so much energy, uh, excellent questions, and, and wonderful commentary. And I want to thank everybody in person and online for participating. And for the presentations, I want to be selfish and say thank you. I learned so much about the institution that I get to steward, um, and, and it was wonderful to see. Um, Dr. Gardner, thank you for once again coming to, uh, to Lehman. I think if I remember correctly, it's your third time through. And uh, oh, about 20 years ago, a, a, a very, very, very young and naive administrator from ASU was that I believe it was an American Association of Higher Education meeting. So long ago, that organization doesn't even exist anymore. Um, and I believe Dr. Gardner gave a presentation. It might've been a workshop on the first year experience. And that was helpful for me because I began my career at that institution, Arizona State University West, when it was a transfer only institution. And uh, we became a, uh, a, a traditional institution with residence hall and first year students in 2002. Uh, but for most of the previous two decades, that institution was defined by the fact that it only survived because of its partnerships, in particular with the Maricopa County Community College District. And so maybe it's, maybe it's poignant that I've arrived at, at Lehman and I get to participate with the, the energy and the thought leadership and the commitment of the faculty and staff at Lehman at yet again, another institution uh, which aims to serve an underserved population in the most effective ways and primarily through um, a transfer population. So um, probably for the 50th time since I've been here, um, I, feel, I feel like I've come home and I feel energized by the questions and the comments and even the concerns that I took note of today. So I appreciate everybody's commitment. Dr. Wosu, Dr. Brown, uh, Dr. Zadko, thank you and your staff, the folks in IT, wonderful day today as well. Thank you for all the good that you do in connecting us. And uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. I'll turn it back to you, Victor or Peter. Thank you. I, I want to join the president and again thanking everyone, particularly the planning committee, uh, for for really putting this together. Allison um, and Olena will co-chair the planning committee. I want to thank you all and uh, those who worked really uh, every day or, uh, to make sure this was a successful event. Thank you. We had 23 presenters today. Uh, it, it was really, uh, as uh, Dr. Gardner mentioned, it takes a village to really get all of those together, but it demonstrates also the college's commitment. All of you, faculty and staff, who took time to uh, get uh, together and really uh, share your thoughts, share what the work you've been doing with the rest of the college community and certainly the CUNY uh, community, thank you so much. The president has referenced uh, the logistics that, that went into this IT multimedia. Uh, the Office of the Provost, I want to thank Maria and the team in uh, BNG, Public Safety, everyone that's worked very hard to get us today. All faculty, staff, chairs, directors, the deans, the associate deans, uh, and administration working collectively to get us to today. I want to extend a deep appreciation to Dr. Zoe at the central office who joined us this afternoon and uh, EVC Lemons as well. And then finally, I want to thank our wonderful moderators, Dr. Brown and Dr. Zadko for doing a fantastic work. Let's give them really, both of them a round of applause for coordinating and organizing this. On behalf of our president, Dr. Delgado, uh, this summit stands uh, closed today. Again, Dr. Gardner, thank you so much. And uh, we wish you very safe travels back home. We will be in touch. Thank you.